Today, I am joined by one of Australia's most decorated softballers in the Aussie Spirit squad. As she's debuted for her country back in 2009, has picked up multiple awards and leagues around the world, including the esteemed university at the esteemed University of Hawaii. She's one of a handful of non-Japanese nationals playing in the Japan Softball League, and she's currently preparing for softball's return to the Olympics. Thank you for joining me today, Kaya Parnaby. Thanks for having me. I want to take it all the way back to be the beginning. Tell me about how the role sport played in your childhood and where did softball sort of start for you? So back in primary school in what's that, 2000, oh no, God, not 2019, 98, 97, um, my PE teacher kind of just had us all stand on the line and had us throw and catch and she was one of the coaches at the local club, club teams and um, she kind of just said who wants to play softball and yeah it kind of just all steamrolled from there and what was it about softball that I guess caught your your attention really early or you kind of went hang on a sec this is kind of fun I really want to do this a bit more professionally um I think it was just the team aspect I played netball growing up and I was also a swimmer and I guess just being surrounded by your friends all my friends did it at the time and it was kind of just something we did after school and on weekends to hang out together and that kind of drew me in and then um one afternoon I went to a pitching clinic with my sister who at the time was a pitcher and um the pitching coach there was like said to mum she's got the kind of the right body type the right build to become a pitcher has she ever thought about it mum's like no not at all and she's like does she want to come along next week and have a go and I guess everything just went from there my pitching coach took me under her wing and she kind of just gave me from that time when I was 12 she gave me a four five-year plan and was like come 2007 you will make this junior Australian team you'll go to junior world championships and everything kind of just kept going on plan and yeah so 2007 um, I made the junior Australian team and everything just yeah started from there really. What's the commitment when you're at sort of that junior level when you're trying to make a national team how many days are you training how are you balancing it all with school I guess? It was tough. Um, when I was growing up, especially when I started out, my mum and dad would catch to me just down in the local park. I'd want to be out there throwing every day. My pitching coach would set me back in the day. She'd give me a worksheet because obviously technology wasn't a thing then. And she, I had to tick off what I did and I had to hand that basically to her when I saw her twice a week. But I was out at the ballpark every day, whether it be a local football oval, a cricket pitch, anywhere I could pitch. Um, I was out there with my mum and dad until... They got too scared to catch me and then um, I teamed up with one of my um, local uh, catchers from Manly and we were out there maybe four or five times a week. She travelled down to the northern beaches from Chatswood and we just, you know, do that five times a week, six times a week, play a game on a weekend and it was a lot of commitment, a lot of um, managing my school. I was very lucky that I went to a sports high school um, from seven to ten, so they were very accommodating. Uh, with all my training schedules and having to leave school early on a Wednesday to get out to Blacktown to train. But yeah, like it's just time management. And I guess my mom being a school teacher really helped me with that. So it worked out well. So you mentioned you played a lot of netball as well. What sort of level did you get with netball? Because I believe you, you were pretty good at that as well from what I hear. Uh, I, I stayed at club. I was in development rep teams and stuff like that, but my mom represented New South Wales at netball and my sister, um, was a rep netballer as well. So for me, yeah, I wasn't, I never grew to the height of the netballer needed, nor the physique of a netballer, but I was okay with that. I found my passion in softball. And um, even though my mom and my sister were so heavily involved in netball, um, they kind of let me go on my way in softball, which was nice. So obviously softball doesn't probably have the profile in Australia that it does in other countries like Japan and America. What was it like growing up playing a sport and playing it at such a high level, but kind of knowing that you weren't sure what the, the height was you were going to be able to achieve in the sport? Yeah, I guess back in the day, I don't know if women's sport had, the, had a high profile in many sports. So um, we didn't have a backing of a men's sport like a lot of other sports do, but I guess... I grew up with it still being an Olympic sport. So obviously like my, my end goal was to play at the Olympics and I was lucky enough to train with the girls in the lead up to um, Beijing in 08. And I think ever since I joined that end Swiss squad, squad back in 2006, like I aspired to be what they were and how good they were and how, like how they trained their work ethic, um, 
the I guess the little the fine details that they were able to do and stuff like that like yeah I just aspired to be an Olympian like them and that's who I looked up to um, from a young age yeah talking about the Olympics you've obviously got a strong affiliation with the Olympics having been involved in the opening ceremony I believe when you're at school yeah so back in primary school I think I was in grade five um, my school was lucky enough to be chosen to perform in the opening, opening and closing ceremony at the Sydney Games. And I don't know, it's, it's hard to describe what that was like. It was so cool when, I mean, I was 10 and just going on the bus. Like we did so many re- closed rehearsals, undisclosed rehearsals. No one knew where we were in Sydney because we weren't allowed to know our location. Um just all those memories of the rehearsals and then actually having the final dress rehearsal the day before the opening ceremony. That was incredible actually seeing what was then Stadium Australia. And then the day of the opening ceremony, like being in that stadium, I don't even like, and seeing everyone around you, like, yeah, it was amazing. And I, I could only imagine what it would be like to be an athlete in there. Do you have many memories of, I guess, the actual performances of some of the athletes from 2000 or is it mainly that incredible opening ceremony experience that sticks in your mind? Um, no, I, I don't have any real... I have one memory of the softball. I didn't really play softball back in 2000. So I went to one game and I think it was Australia versus Italy maybe. Um, and that was really cool for me. But my biggest fondest memory of the um, 2000 Olympics sport wise was watching the four by 100 meter relay. I, th- I think it was win the gold with like, um, like Ian Thor, Michael Clem and all them when they played the guitar, that was like my biggest best memory of the games. I was actually in the family section out at um, Homebush watching it and just everyone coming together um, and celebrating no matter who they were. It was a really cool, I guess, Australian environment. Yeah. Do you think that in in some aspect or or some shape and form, seeing that and being involved in the opening ceremony, that kind of lit a fire to go, I kind of want to be involved in this in some way down the future? Um, I think looking back now, yeah, definitely. I think as a child, like as a child, I was 10, um, I didn't really think I didn't even like, like, as I said, I didn't really play softball back then. So it was never a, Oh my God, I want to go to the Olympics. Like I was a swim, I was, you know, a swimmer, um, went to swimming training (laughs) um, and I played netball and, you know, I never thought I'd make something of myself in sport, but as it went on, then Athens rolled around and I was into softball then. And I watched um, like the likes of Brooke Wilkins and Melanie Roach pitch at the Athens games that kind of just lit a fire in me and was like, this is what I'm going to do. I'd already started pitching. um, And my coach was like, here's your timeline. And I was kind of like, okay, yep. This is what I want to do. Like, I want to do that. Like I want to be those people that I was watching on TV. You talk about those people like Brooke and Mel in 2004 in Athens. Are they the sort of people that you looked up to once you started sort of taking softball more seriously? Absolutely. Like Brooke being a left-handed pitcher, me being left-handed pitcher it was kind of like yeah like everything aligned for me and then I was actually lucky enough to be mentored by Brooke back in the early days and stuff like that and Mel has been a coach of mine and a friend of mine for many years now and looking up to them both as athletes but also as as women like they both are so strong and powerful and have such a strong message behind them that I really like, I, I still look up to them this day, even though they're retired. So it's it's great to have women like that who have come before me. You've obviously had a lot of success through the junior level and now at the senior level, but going back to say junior national championships, I believe under 16, under 19s and under 23s, you won the best pitcher award. Was, was there kind of a bit of hype, I guess, around you coming through the system and kind of winning all these awards? And did you feel any pressure on the back of it? Um, I feel like I was a little unique in the sense that there was not many left-handed pitchers rolling around the the softball scene back in the day with me. So I feel like I had a little something that other pitchers might have not had, but 
I don't know, I worked hard and I did feel a lot of pressure as I got older because I had success when I was younger. Um, so as I went through the junior levels from 16s to 19s, and I think I played 23s back when I was still in under 19s. Um, so yeah, just a little, a little bit of pressure, but I always knew, especially when I was the youngest age of 19s, I still had role models that I looked up to and so on. And when I was playing 23s, I remember that final, I was pitching against Justine Smithhurst and she went on to pitch that same year, basically at um, the Olympics. So it was kind of, yeah, everything was like, I don't know. It was kind of cool for me. <laughs> and you mentioned before training with the, the sort of 08 squad ahead of Beijing. Was it yeah. always just a plan to train? Were you ever close to maybe being selected as well at that stage? Oh, no, I definitely wasn't close to being selected back then. I was only 17. Um, I got brought into that in Swiss squad as a junior Australian spirit player. Um, so we trained with them and then I did get a little glimpse of what it could look like to be in that open Australian team. Back in um, 2008, we played uh, a series against the Japanese national team, their, their, their Olympic team. And um, I remember Troy Davis stopped giving me the ball against Japan and I had um, Danika Hallett catching to me who was in the running to be in that 08 team too. And I just looked behind me and I had Natalie Ward, Stacey Porter, um, Kerry Wyborn, Simone Morrow, uh, Belinda right now Barnes. Like I had the Australian lineup behind me and I was just in awe of this little 17 year old playing against the Japanese national team. And um, so I don't think I was, I was never in the running. I never went to Olymp Olympic team camp, but that to me was enough at 17. <laughs> At that stage, when you're in the camp, had they confirmed that 2008 would be, I guess, the last sort of Olympics until now for softball? Um, I don't know if we knew before the 08 Games or if it was like at the 08 Games that we knew it was going to be the last. I do remember them coming together after, um, after the last game in Beijing and putting like back 2012 or back softball, I think it was. Um, but I don't know as early as like January, if we knew that that was going to be it. But by the games we did. What did you feel like when you found out that I guess that could be the last time softball was at the Olympics, having so sort of just had this taste in the national team, seeing them go and compete in Beijing, win a medal, and then to hear you might not get that chance? Um, I don't know if I knew the impact that it would make on my career, like have on my career at that time. Like I was still... 17, 18, I was just finishing school. I, my, the next step for me was going to college. I don't think I thought making the Opens national team and even I don't think I really thought too much beyond what I was doing within the next six months. But I guess as the years went on, definitely, I, I, I found not just the impact on not going to a Games earlier than what this is, but the impact of the, the funding that we lost as a, as a sport and I felt that more so earlier on than not having the chance to compete with the Olympic Games. You finally got to make your, your Australian debut age 18 over in Canada in 2009. Um, what was that experience like? I imagine a lot of those players that you mentioned before when you, you sort of trained as part of the squad heading into Beijing, a lot of those players would have been there as well and you would have just been like, wow, I'm actually playing with them now. I'm here with this site. Yeah, that was um, surreal, I guess. Um mm. It was a, sorry, it was a long time ago now, so I'm just like going back in my memory bank. But I guess you'll never forget the first time you take the field in an Australian jersey. And, yeah, just to be able to finally play alongside all those people you'd looked up to for so many years and having Tracy Mosley catch to you who I've only ever played against before. But knowing, like, her I guess how much knowledge and wealth and knowledge she had in the game and her being able to pass that on to me as such a young athlete and knowing yeah like I didn't know these these um international teams I was playing against but I just had the absolute trust and faith in my team behind me and my catchers and my coach that they were leading me in the right direction so 2009 I remember the day I got the phone call I was at college in LA and I missed the phone call and I was so nervous. I was like, oh, my God. And then um, when I got it, I was like, this is incredible. This is so, like, this is wow. 
So it was really cool to have all that experience, um, especially with those players that, I don't know, I still go, wow, they left such a legacy in the game. So it was cool to play with them. Did you feel much of a, a step up in terms of the level of competition when you played there? Like, did you go, hang on a sec, okay, this international level is another step up? Absolutely. Like, it was, like, I played some hard games at nationals before, but I don't think I'd played that kind of game. Like, I was still playing the likes of, like, Natasha Watley, Jenny Finch, um, all of those great American players like they were still around when I debuted and just to be able to take the same diamond as them like I was like wow this is happening and then I really had to compose myself and be like okay they're great I now have to like step up a level and perform because what I've been doing domestically is not gonna really help me here like I need to go to another level but yeah going to another level that was a challenge in itself especially being fresh 18 year old so you kind of mentioned the college system and being over in LA and I believe a lot of sort of different colleges and places in the, in America were, were chasing your signature, I guess, coming out of Australia and coming out of school. What was it like having so many people sort of going, we want you to come play for our college and why did you end up at University of Hawaii in 2010? Um, I, think, I think knowing the history that Hawaii had with Australians, I was the 12th Australian to go to the University of Hawaii. Um, and having the likes of Stacey Porter, Justine Smethurst, Claire Warwick, um, Brooke Wilkins, I could keep going on with them all, but just knowing that they've had such a great college experience, everything with Hawaii, I think I felt safe going there and comfortable. And not saying like I was a home person, I am a home person, but like it was the closest to home as well. And I grew up on the beach in Sydney and going to Hawaii kind of just it, it is the transition of leaving home. Um, but yeah, like I, I'm very grateful for the four years I spent in Hawaii. Like, yeah, it was great. <laughs> the weather would have been a lot better there as well than some of those Midwestern states in America. We definitely didn't get this, the tornadoes and all that, but we definitely <laughs> did get typhoon season. <laughs> yes. Yes. What was it like during those four years there? I know, I think looking at sort of your records, you broke plenty of records, especially in that final season. You sort of had a, the all time, the season win record and the, the strikeout record. Was it just a really good environment to grow as a softballer? Um, I think over the four years, I grew as a person and then the softball came with that. I think um, not being around your friends and family and being in a very strange not comfortable environment had to make you grow in some way. And I think um, having good mentors within my softball team, I think that helped me grow. And um, from my freshman year, I had a picture, um, her sister, actually her younger sister, Kaylani is on the U S team, but Steph was the best role model I could ever hope for. She was a year older than me. She was already the established ace of the team um, and she just helped me grow and we worked really well as a one-two combination um, for my, well, three years. Last year I was by myself. But, um, yeah, we just worked as a really great combination. My freshman year we went to the World Series, which was the first time in um, school history. So we had a record-breaking year there. And I think just the way that her and I were able to get on as a pitching combination um, really helped the team camaraderie and helped us really flourish, especially to do all that. So. And at that time, you've obviously made your Australian debut, but there's no Olympics, I guess, to kind of look forward to at that stage. Is it just about those world championships? I believe they sort of upped those from every four years to every two years as a result. And how much was it there a focus of going, okay, I want to make sure I'm there for the Aussie spirit at each of those world championships? 100% world championships at that time was the pinnacle of our sport and you wanted to be named in that roster to go. Um, I was lucky enough to get into the... 2010, 12 and 14 and 16 teams. Oh yeah, if we're just talking about college times. Um, and the time I spent in Hawaii prepared me to play on those bigger stages because American hitters are scary. Like they're big, they're scary. They swing the bat hard. They helped me develop to be the international pitcher I am. They allowed me to work on my stuff. I was lucky enough to train wherever I wanted, whenever I wanted. And yeah, those world championships 
will always be my fondest memories. Like every team I went away with, we were something different. We always bought something different to the ballpark, but we were still always Australian. And we still always bought the best we had that day. We never, we never walked off the field going, well, we could have done that. Like we always left everything behind us. So they're my fondest. Even without the Olympics there, did you see a lot of growth within that Australian team, like young players coming through and that real camaraderie that I guess you're kind of speaking about there? Yeah, so we had a solid group of us um, start together back in 09 and kind of we've kind of the, the core groups kind of kept through right until now. And since then we've seen younger players come in and come out and like, yeah, and then we've seen the younger ones now, maybe from about two or three years ago, and they've really honed in and made, solidified their, their spots on the squad. And for the last three three to four years, we've kind of had a very similar squad continue to, to continue to grow together, which has been really nice. I guess the other big international league that you've been a part of is this Japan Super League. Um, can you tell me how the opportunity came to play over there, who approached you and I guess kind of put into words just how big a deal it is that we've got you and both Stacey playing over there. Yeah. So my senior year of college, I was approached then by Melanie Roach. Um, who, Full circle. <laughs> yeah. Who had said to me, Hey, look, um, Justine's thinking of, um, you know, not going back to the Japanese team next year how would you feel about joining? And I was like, this would be really awesome. And at the time, my coach, my my former coach in the Japanese league was looking at me for, to, to full go my senior year at college and just go jump right into the league. And Melly kind of said, well, she can't do that. She's got one year at college left. She needs to graduate. And my, the coach then was like, well, we need someone now. So Vanessa Stokes actually stepped in and, played a year in the league um, in my interim. And then when I graduated, um, yeah, I just, we, Mel and I spoke again. Um, I flew over to Japan a couple of times and met the company, met the team. And then I signed my contract and I guess the rest is history. I'm still at the same team. Can you talk me through about, about the league a little bit more? Cause I was reading a bit about it, how sort of like the corporations own each individual team, who are you playing to each game? And I guess how big are the crowds and just how big is the sport over there? Yeah. So um, in division one, there's 12 teams and we are, and there is also a division two and two division two leagues. I'm pretty sure. Um, and we're all owned by individual companies. So my company is called SG holdings and we're a transport company. Um, then there's the likes of Toyota, Hitachi, um, Bit Camera, which is their big, I guess, JB Hi-Fi company, massive electronics, um, Honda, Denso and Shockey, which are two subsidiaries of um, Toyota, um, NEC, uh, Nihon Seiko. Um, yeah, just a whole bunch of teams that are owned by companies. Our girls, when they're not playing softball or training, they actually have jobs within the company. So my girls all work for um, one of our subsidiaries, which is Sagoa Cuban. So they deal with domestic um, deliveries and stuff like that, kind of like UPS, um, DHL and stuff like that. That's what my kind of company is. Um, and yeah, it's, it's an incredible league to be a part of. Every team has the option and opportunity to have um, two foreign players on their team. Not every team has foreign players. Some of them just, like choose to be strictly Japanese based. Uh, there's about, I think there's about eight or 10 of us foreign players in the league in total, which is kind of cool. And um, two years ago, we actually had another Australian, Ellen Roberts, join Ogaki Minamo. And so, yeah, so now we've got three Australians in the league and it's, it's pretty awesome. So we're getting there. Australia is becoming, we're getting more players involved. What is it like as, I guess, an international player going over there? Like we, we sort of look at sports here in Australia, you think of your crickets, your rugby leagues and things like that. When an international player comes and plays in Australia, they're really highly regarded and well-respected. I can imagine it would be something similar in Japan when you've got an international player coming and playing for your team. It must be a pretty big deal. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a big deal and there's a lot of pressure put on you mm. to perform. Um, they're paying you to perform and 
they want to like they want to see you be that player that wins people the game. They want to they want you to be the ace. They want you to like, in terms of hitting, they want you to hit that home run or that winning run. Um, so there's a lot of pressure on us foreign players to perform. Our um, our contracts are reviewed every year, and if we don't perform, I guess they have the chance to go. Well, we're getting someone new, so that's always pressure. Um, the unknown of are you going to have a job the next year if you don't perform? Um, so yeah, they're kind of big, and the crowd kind of riles you up a bit. You know, they love foreign players. They love they love softball. So like they they just support whoever, but. Yeah, just the pressure of performing, I guess, as an international player. That's probably the biggest that you put on yourself and just knowing that you have to perform because your team isn't, they're not relying solely on you because it's a team sport, but they look at you to lead the team, basically. Do you remember your first game in the league? It must have been, I, I, I think you used the word surreal before, it must have been that, going over there, this amazing, incredible league and being part of it for the first time. Yeah, um, I do remember it actually. We were playing in Nagoya Dome and we were playing a team called Tayo Yudin and their pitcher um, pitches on the national team, Fujita. And she's the same age as me. So I grew up um, playing against her at junior junior um, world championships and stuff like that and back in the Japanese team. But I just remember me going head to head with her. I was playing in a fully enclosed dome, this massive major league dome. There was, we didn't have, we had like all the, seats behind home plate were covered but I mean the outfield they didn't have many spectators out there but just the amount of spectators I'm used to it was like 10 times what we had there we like we don't get any like too many people here in Australia out of the softball game but in Japan like they've got your company people you've got your your everyday general supporters and I just remember the noises that was making you have brass bands that come and cheer you on as your team and yeah, just taking the field against like Tyo Yudin and opening game is you play one game that weekend. So you've just got one job. You play opening game. That's that's what you do that weekend. And the pressure that you feel from your company to win that first game is crazy. Like that's what you train for from when the league finishes the previous October to when the league starts in April again is that first game. And that's all they care about. So it's just a lot of pressure on that game. <laughs> Do you feel like, I, I kind of asked it when you were at Hawaii, did you feel like a girl as a, as a softballer? But I imagine being in Japan and being surrounded by all that incredible quality in terms of international talent, you would have yeah. seen a lot of growth in your own personal game there as well. Oh, absolutely. You, and you see it just week to week in training because you have to continually evolve. You can't keep doing, there's so much, so many video cameras around you that the other teams are watching footage of you that you've got to continually evolve week to week just to be successful, just to be able to even get outs in this league. Um, so, yeah, the growth that I've seen from the seven years I've been there is just incredible. Like I came over, I thought I was a mature pitcher, but I came over as a little young naive pitcher. And the way I've been able to grow in the league um, I've learned a lot more resilience than I thought I needed to know. And I've learned how to find outs when you don't have your best game that day and just stuff like that. How do you, if even if you're not at the top of your game that day, how do you get the best out of yourself and how do you get the best for the team? So that's been a lot of, um, a lot of losing battles I've had to fight with that one, but I've managed to manage to find some, find it somewhere along the line. Do you remember where you were when you found out that softball would be coming back to the Tokyo Olympics? Actually, I do. Um, so it was one of our days off, actually. And we're in Japan and it was me, Stacey Porter, and Melanie Roach. We had um, a couple of friends visiting us from Australia and we actually found out that it was going to be back in um, the Olympics and we we're in Kyoto so we raced to the Golden Temple and we just had a day out in Kyoto, did some videos um, for Softball Australia that, to- that it was coming back to Tokyo, but I think it was just a perfect backdrop for us. We were in Japan. We were in where it was going to be. Um, we were able to go to one of, like, the best sites ever, um, World Heritage Site in the Golden Temple, and just have, like, be immersed in the Japanese culture, knowing that we were going to be there come the next Olympics. So it was pretty cool to um, be amongst all of it when it got announced, yeah. How special do you think it is that 
the sport is making its return. I'll touch on the fact that it won't be in Paris in a sec, but that it's coming back to Japan, that it's kind of like almost like the home of softball, I guess, in a way. Look, it's kind of relit this candle inside every softball player. Like every softball player can now dream again that they're going to be, in, like they can be an Olympian. Like it's, it even relit the, like the fire in our tummies knowing shoot like if we thought we were nearing the end of our career just hold on like you guys have got so much more to give you're not done yet like I don't know it's just opened more avenues and more doors for so many so many younger softballers that have always just wanted to be I don't know play for Australia do all this like you know the we've got endless possibilities it may not be in it may not be in Paris but hey let's let's go for LA let's go for let's hopefully Australia hosting it in 2032 like you know there's so many more possibilities for us now that we've kind of just got our foot back in the door with um Tokyo something you kind of mentioned there was like a lot of rejuvenation for the sport something that I've seen sort of keeping a closer eye on softball now that it's back in the Olympics is there seems to be a lot more youth coming through into the Aussie spirit setup that we've got a really talented junior program and um, is that something that you noticed as well that now that we're back sort of in the Olympics that there's this incredible new like generation of softballers coming through with this goal of I want to play softball at the Olympics and I know I can do that now. I think people's dreams were really, as I said, like like before it was kind of like world championships is our pinnacle and that's amazing. But when you talk to people outside of softball, they don't know about world championships until like they know about the Olympics. Why aren't you in the Olympics? They don't understand it. A lot of people go, Why? And so it's the explanation to people, you know, that, oh, well, this happened and then this happened and, you know. So I think having the Olympics as a public thing now, like people outside of softball know what the Olympics is. So it's easier to talk. It's easier for people to, you know, have dreams and stuff for that kind of stuff. And I think with the the youth coming through our program, we have such a talented bunch. Like I train with them every day and our young ones, they just, they have so much to give and they're so, they're so young and fresh and have so much more untapped talent than they know. Um, I just can't wait to see what comes from them in 2028, 2032. Like they're just going to be very special. And by then, like, I'm going to look at Tani and I'm going to be like, you're, you're me. Like you're what I was eight years ago. Now it's your turn. So go out there and do what, like, and she's so talented. So she needs, to, like, yeah, our younger ones, I give props to them because they've got a lot of potential coming through. Obviously, you would have started preparing as a squad going, okay, July 2020, this is this is our time to get back on the world stage. And then everything starts unravelling with COVID-19 and the Olympics eventually get postponed. Do you remember where you were when you, you found out that Tokyo 2020 I guess it hadn't been rescheduled at that stage, but it was in doubt and they said it wouldn't be happening this year. Yeah, I was sitting on my couch at home and I'd just been told I wasn't going back to Japan. So I kind of was like, okay, the Japanese league's been postponed. I don't know what's going on with the Olympics here. And then I'm sitting watching Sunrise and it's like Olympics (laughs) cancelled. And I was like, wait, we haven't got an email from anyone yet. Do I listen to the media? (laughs) And about half an hour later, we had an email from um, the AOC saying, unfortunately, from what you hear on the media, the Olympics has been cancelled. It's not cancelled. It's just postponed. Um, So that kind of gave me a little bit of relief knowing that, like, okay, it's just postponed. It's just another year away. But, yes, I remember sitting on the couch and I was just staring at the TV and I was like, you're kidding me. I was like 12 years <laughs> and it's done four months out, like four months out of the Olympics and you've done 12 years of me away. <laughs> How so, has the, the last sort of 12 months been, I guess, for you kind of so much uncertainty around it and especially since it, it's not going to be at Paris 2024, do you think that has kind of made it a bit almost harder for you to cope with the last 12 months, not knowing what will be happening? I don't think it's made it harder. I think it's made us hungrier to compete in July. But I think we just learned, like, it's everything that's happening in the world right now is so unpredictable that you've just kind of got to roll with the punches. And what we know is we're better off than a lot of other people and we've just got to be grateful for our, like, our family's health, our health, 
our country's health and the fact that, you know what, like we're doing a pretty good job with COVID right now. So we just gotta be thankful that our country is is healthy. And um, we're just gonna, yeah, roll with the punches as to what comes internationally. We know that it's not gonna be a one battle in um, the next few months. So we're just gonna learn how to adapt and hopefully um, how to adapt and compete with a world still of like that has COVID going through it because I don't know I feel like if we keep shutting down um, we're just not going to get anywhere so I feel like the more we learn to live with it and the more we learn especially with these vaccines rolling out it's just going to be yeah roll with the punches and go with what happens. Yeah, so as soon as as soon as we found out it was postponed, we had obviously a Zoom meeting with our squad because we couldn't meet face to face. Um, and our high performance manager, she just basically went, "All right, guys, time out." She's like, "We're all going to go on to different programs now. We're just going to we're just going to worry about the longevity." So everyone, I want to have a break. So from that moment, I. I I put down my softball. I didn't have to worry about throwing it to a net because I couldn't throw to a catcher or stuff like that. And we all just had complete time off softball. And honestly, I don't, I can't speak for my teammates, but for me, who's been day in, day out for so many years now, it was the time I needed to be able to really kick back into action when they said, all right, guys, we're back into training now. This is what's happening. So it was so nice to be able to have, I think we ha- ended up having two months off with everything that went on. And we just really worked on our strength and conditioning and no softball. And it was for me, the best thing that had happened because it allowed me to appreciate softball again and really want to train. Because going day in, day out, you struggle sometimes to find goals and to find the why reason. And I felt, I found once I had that two months off, I was so hungry to play softball again. Like that's all I wanted to do. All I wanted to do was train, get back out there with my teammates and yeah as much as it was hard to be in a lockdown and not see them it was and not pick up a softball it was probably the two months that I needed to really relax and yeah get back into it you're getting prepared to go back into camp with the spirit I think it's tomorrow when we're recording this how long has it been since like a full proper camp with them our last camp was actually at the AIS just before lockdown. So probably this time last year or just before this. Um, it's a long, it was a long year, a long, long year. We've had like battery camps here and there. So I've seen all the other pitches and catches, um, but I haven't seen the whole squad. There's been some girls who we used to spend nine months of the year together and I haven't seen them since last March. So it's been a very long year, but um we're so excited to get down to Canberra tomorrow and see everyone and be together again and um, really get to start working together as a unit. <laughs> so how much softball have you been able to play in the last 12 months? I, I think you did get back over to Japan at some stage once they rescheduled everything, but beyond that, does it feel weird that you maybe haven't played as much softball in the last 12 months as you would have going into a, a, a such a big year like this? Hundred percent. The only competitive games I've played has been back when I was in Japan, and I finished that in October. Um, we've been very lucky and very fortunate in our preparation to this camp that I've just recently relocated back to New South Wales. Um, so I was very lucky to join this New South Wales group where there's eleven of us, and where we can field a team and we can play um, small scrimmages against each other, and we've got three pitches and. So we've been very fortunate to be able to battle it out against each other, but a full-blown competitive game, yeah, October last year. So it's it's very different preparation to what I'm used to. No nationals and stuff like that. So, yeah, no APC. So, yeah, it, I mean, it's going to be great because we're all, we're all in the same boat. So it's kind of nice, fresh. How do you feel going into Tokyo now? Do you have any, I guess concerns about the situation at the moment are you concerned about having to do quarantine even though I'm sure you've already you probably had to done a couple already going over to Japan how are you feeling about heading over there again I'm excited I have no concerns I completely trust the IOC and the AOC and I know that they'll have our best interests and every everyone's best interests at heart whether whether we be athletes support staff coaches um I know that whatever 
situation that we, we are in over there where the, we're probably likely to be in a bubble, um, we're going to be safe. We're going to be the best, the best prepared we can be with the best facilities and team around us to keep us safe from COVID that I have no issues heading over there. I feel very safe um, with the AOC behind us with everything, but it's going to be fun to play softball. It's the best part of it. We get to play softball at the end of the day. <laughs> What do you think the, the next steps are for softball, specifically here in Australia, to take it to this next level? Obviously, being back in the Olympics is a huge step, but we've seen tournaments like the Summer Slam come in and really, I guess, give rejuvenise the sport a little bit. And do you think it's just doing things like that to open it up to a newer audience a little bit more? Definitely. I love Summer Slam. It is so much fun. It's, you get to take a step back out of, I guess, because we've been playing it after APC, which is so serious. Because it's, you know, you're playing international countries, you know, you're in Australia. Then you get to go back to SummerSlam and you get to play with, like, our first year we got to play with the Italians, um, Chinese Taipei, the New Zealanders. Like, we got to play with some of our competitors and it was so much fun because we got to, like, I remember turning to my shortstop, Amanda Farmer, who's the Italian shortstop, and I turned to her and I said, throwing this inside drop ball, it's going to come to you and you're going to roll a double with Tamika. And all of a sudden, like, we turned around and it happened. And it was just fun like that because we got to, like, you know, say this is what's going to happen and just and have some fun in softball instead of, like, you know, just being so serious. And I feel like if we can show the younger generation that it is, we have fun playing. It's not all just serious. Like, we are serious, but we are able to have fun playing the game. I really think that that's going to help the younger generation really stick with softball and, um, like, keep continue playing. And it's the fun different kind of versions of softball that I think will help the younger generation like I don't know it to me summer slam is so much fun and I'm I'm not going to be here this year for it but I'm really excited to be able to watch it as a spectator this year and just see everything unroll so it'll be great how do you think the sports changed since you debuted for the national team back in 2009 have you have you noticed many changes in that time I think I think a lot of ways, like there's been a lot of a lot of evolution within the game itself and a lot of new ways to do things and how you do things, how you throw balls, how you different ways to swing a bat, um, different, yeah, it's it's just evolved in a way that like the pitchers are trying to keep up with the hitters now, where it used to be the hitters were trying to keep up with the pitchers. Now we're trying to evolve as quickly as the hitters are because we just don't want to keep getting smashed. So we've got to evolve as much as they are. And I think it's just a lot of like cat and mouse. We're all chasing each other a little, at little different at places. And I think that's where I see the game evolving. I think technology has, has helped the game evolve. We grew up and we didn't have the blast things that they chuck on the end of their bat to see what the bat plane, like their swing plane is and stuff like that. Or for pitchers, like we never had rap soda growing up where we like where this machine tells us how many revolutions our ball spinning in a rise ball, like just crazy stuff like that. So the feedback that we're getting now is helping us kind of evolve as softball players. We're not just relying on what our coaches see, like our coaches are getting technology feedback as well and helping us. And then they're evolving as coaches as well. And they know how to do things like more efficiently now for us. So I just see technology being a big part of our game now. Whereas back when I started debuting, all we had was a phone that's megapixels probably weren't great. And they just video us and then we'd get some feedback, but now you can do super slow motion and you've got all this feedback skills and stuff like that. So our game's definitely evolving to be more of a technology-based sport. What's the the goal of the squad going into Tokyo? Obviously, I think Australia has won a medal every time softball has been in the Olympics, but there's obviously that one the one at the top of the medal, medal dais that has eluded Australia. Is this the year that we come back with the gold for softball, do you think? I think we have the team to do it. We have the experience. We have the depth. We have every single piece of the puzzle to do it. I think our team's got to believe in ourselves. I think once we start to believe that we can and actually actually believe we can, I think gold is definitely in the in the in the midst for us. We've always been around with the US, Canada, Japan, Mexico. We've always had very tight battles with them. 
we've won a couple of battles over Japan and the US in um, like previous years. We're just not always consistent. But I think once we believe that we can actually beat these teams consistently and we know we can, um, the gold is the gold is ours to take. And we've just got to believe that because, yeah, as you said, we've got every other colour. We just don't have that. So with it coming back, I, just, I don't see why we can't believe that we can. I just, I see this group and I see how much talent they have and how much we do or want it. So I think the biggest thing for us is mentally and just believing. Having obviously played in quite a few different iterations of the national team, being a part of the side that qualified um, what, two years now, I think it is, that was there a special feeling in that group? Did you feel like that there is that togetherness that will bring that confidence that you're talking about? Yeah, um, that was probably the first time that I've really felt like nothing was going to beat us. Um, the I, I can't even put words together as to what that was, but I remember in that in the last game against China, like the first game I was so nervous I couldn't breathe till the fifth inning and um, Cheesy was really worried about me, but <laughs> he's like, once we get runs, you'll be fine. I'm like, yeah, 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 just hurry up with that. Um <laughs> But in that game against China, I remember China coming out and scoring a few runs in the first inning and I was like, oh, my God, like we're behind. We need to win this game. Um, but then I just remembered going back into the dugout and going, my team's got it. Like they're fine. And I just had this, even though we were behind, I had this sense of calmness in me that my team's got this. I know they've got this. And then all of a sudden they came out and they built, like they belted so many runs in and I was just like, I knew they had it. Like I was really calm and I think it's because we we all believed that we were going to win that game and I don't think I've ever really felt that in some other games like I've known we're going to win but we've never wholly believed that we were going to win and I think because we had such the target on us if we didn't win that game we didn't qualify I think everyone knew the importance of that game and what it meant and everyone believed that we were going to win because everyone knew Australia's qualifying for the Olympics like why are we thinking otherwise so I think it was the first time that we'd all really bought into something and it really showed because that team fought. That team, I've never seen that team play like that before and they were amazing. I cannot wait to see you guys all in Tokyo at the Olympics this year. I, I guess the final thing that I want to end on that I ask a lot of people once at, to wrap up the podcast is what are you most proud of in your career to date? Is there something that sticks out in your mind that goes yeah, that's the thing that I'm so proud of achieving or is it something more holistic that you've gone, I'm proud to have seen the growth of something over a period of time? Uh, proud, okay. There's a lot of ways I can go with this and I think, I think I'm going to go with the holistic version and go, I've seen this core bunch of girls go from, apart from Stace who was, was already the captain when we came into the team, but the rest of us, we were little naive 18, 19 year olds coming into this Australian team with a dream of participating, going to a world championship, winning a medal at a world championship, hopefully like going to Olympic games. And I think my proudest moment is watching us persevere with all the ups and downs of the sport and not knowing where it was going to lead us next, but really sticking it out and getting here together as a group. I think that's going to hold us in really good stead in Tokyo where we've been together for 11 years now this core group of us we know the ins and outs of people and I'm just proud of them for not giving up and not giving up on each other and continuing to fight even though when times got tough really cliche but we've we've done we've dealt with a lot of a lot of ups and downs in this sport over the last 11 years so it's yeah, I'm just proud that they've that they're still there with me, and um, a lot of them they get to I, I don't know if, I don't know what's happening after this, but a lot of them get to end or get to an Olympic Games, and we get to all do it together since we started our journey together. I think it may be cliche, but I think it's a perfect answer, especially in a sport like you said that's had so many ups and downs. Kai, I can't wait to see you get to experience your first Olympics as an athlete later this year. I wish you all the best, and thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me.